Hello, my name is Brian Price and today I'm going to talk about successful designs. Before I go into this, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I've been a software developer for the past seven years, which means I went from a junior developer to a lead developer during that period. I've also, but I've been in the industry for over 20 years now and I actually have written code during that entire time. I am currently in my, I've been in my company now for about seven months, but before then I was at my previous company for over 10 years. And even during that time, I had 14 managers over those 10 years. So what this means is throughout most of my career, I've been the new guy. I've been somebody that a new person coming onto an existing team that has their way of doing things. And what this allowed me to see is that how teams function, how, how each team do um, does their own thing and what seems to work and what doesn't where i think most people in this career they have built and they have been able to build their own team or their own way of doing things and seen the success where i've been able to see both the success and failures of others so today i'm going to break it up into five topics the first one is the process today and this is something i've seen time and time again throughout um, my career then i'll go into why it doesn't work then i'll talk about why i'm giving this talk today then what I'm trying to solve for, I'll give a list out the things, what I think that if we helped cultivate would lead to a, a successful design. And finally, the solution to, to those problems. First, the process. Every design comes from finding a problem or it could be an inefficiency. We will see something going on and we think there's gotta be a better way of doing this. From there, you come up with an idea. You come up with, you think, okay, I know how this team works. I know how this application works. I know what the problem is. Therefore, I think I have an idea on how we should be moving forward. Sometimes the idea comes from something you've read online. But once you come up with the idea, you start doing research. You see how has other people done this idea? Has somebody else done this idea? What is it that about your idea that you think may work within this system or your environment or your application? Then you start playing around with your idea. You figure out, okay, let's see how does this idea, how may, how do you think it'll work within your current application? And once you start getting comfortable with this new idea, it no longer becomes new. It just seems like it's certain that this is the best way to go. You start talking with a coworker. You bounce it off um, through him or her seeing, do they have any concerns? Do they, are they seeing something that maybe you're missing? And it goes back and forth. And eventually you both get comfortable with this idea or this new design. Then you present it to the team. You say, okay, here's a problem. Here's where you think you should go. And you give a lot of the evidence on what you think will, will work in the long run. You try to get the team on board with this new vision because what works today is not good enough. Eventually, everyone is on board. Everyone's excited. Say, yes, we're gonna move forward with this. This is a brand new way and it's gonna make our lives so much better. And through this process, the team, you work as a team, you try to get this new design implement or implementation into your application or maybe build a new product or whatever it is but you get the team you're all working together you're moving forward in this new way you're all learning at the same time and you're all contributing to this brand new vision eventually everyone thinks you hit success you get into production everything works everything's going great then about a year later destruction what may be a success today becomes tomorrow's failure that you'll have to work around so this is why I think this process does not work. First, people will lose steam. Everyone has their own interests, their motivations, or even tasks that they may be working on that just because you found a problem that makes sense in the world that you're working in may not make sense in somebody else's. They may be excited for a time, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna last that long as they start focusing on other things or doing other things. Maybe too many cooks where the person who is bringing up a design, maybe they are competing in some direction, a, versus somebody else who may have arguably just as much experience. So now you have two people with the same amount of experience going in two different directions. Or it could be that the person who was initially leading the design is no longer the one running with it. Somebody else may be in charge. The other thing is tenure. Tenure makes it easier to bring up a design. I've seen before where somebody who brings up a design who's new, they are seen as somebody who's trying to change everything. But you can have someone who's tenure bring up the design and they're a visionary trying to move the team forward. Tenure is sometimes is a key to whether it's going to get through or not. The other thing is, you have to be honest, People, how much people like you. You will never get a design through if people don't like you, no matter how technically correct or how beneficial it will be. You have to win people over. 
And this is something I think people sometimes lose sight of or think that this is maybe not as important as it really is. The other thing in that process, you're not explaining a design to everybody else. You're selling a design to everybody else. And this is something to think about that when you talk about the design on something that where the team should be moving forward to, you're trying to make them feel better, which is very much a sales pitch more than anything else. And you have to be honest, it's not right or wrong. It just is a sales pitch. The other thing is herd mentality, that you can have an entire team excited about a new direction, but somebody may have a concern, but they're not gonna bring it up because of all the excitement. That with a design, that bringing up ideas or concerns, it could be seen as a buzzkill. And I, this has happened to me before, I know it has, and I know it's happened to many other people that you start seeing, well, everyone else thinks this is a great idea, so I guess it's a great idea. And this is something you don't really don't wanna cultivate when you start presenting to the team and try to move forward. And finally, no one is to blame. If you really think about all the designs that, uh, that you've probably gone through in my career, at least my career, that I can say that every failed design, somebody else is to blame. And when I say somebody else to blame, it means that if you tell somebody what they may have done, they will point it somewhere else. Or they'll say you are just an equally, you contribute equally to the problem. It's always a case. And what I've heard time and time again from a friend, and it resonates, is blanket accountability. When everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. And that very much is the case in situations like this. So why this talk? I've been starting watching too many TED Talks. This one, this TED Talk here does not apply to this speech, but I think it's still a great one to watch. The, inside the mind of a master procrastinator. It's arguably the most popular TED Talk out there if you haven't seen it already. I would say start off with this one. But one, I, but one that actually starts uh, helped influence this speech here is Simon Sinek's Start With Why, where most people talk about what they're trying to do or how they're trying to do it. Usually the how comes in is when they're trying to sell you, try to make you feel better about it. Like this is how I'm gonna proceed forward. You should feel comfortable about this. But when you start thinking about ideas, start with why, like why are you bringing up a new design? When you start thinking about why, what I've realized is that then the how and the what can actually change over time, but your vision, the why, can still go forward in a direction. And that's what brings people along. The other thing is Tim Hartford, Trial, Error, and the God Complex. And I think this is a great talk where he talks about the differences between just trying and failing something versus someone who thinks they have the right answer. They could be arguably the most experienced and they can have the expertise. And he talks about this a lot in this in this TED talk, and I think it's a brilliant one that I've always resonated, that's always resonated with me. Adam Grant, he's probably extremely famous if you ever uh, watch TED Talks, or sometimes you might see him on Twitter as well. But I love this TED talk here, the original thinkers. He talks about people who are original, come up with original ideas. And this one in particular, he talks about the uh, creators of Warby Parker, the popular glass uh, glasses company that's uh, worth billions. And he talks about why he did not invest in it and some of the signs that he thought were, uh, were timid or that they were not as secure or certain about their, their company that led him to not invest in it. And he goes into what he thinks are original thinkers and how they think, and he talks about both fear and passion, which leads to the next slide, that as I started watching many of these TED Talks, it really starts blending that together. They all start talking about the same thing in different ways, and that's really how you handle your fear and how you handle your passion that when it comes to businesses and organizations, that these are somehow the magic, the secret sauce or what drives innovation forward. And when I started thinking about this, I realized the software world is in its own bubble. If you look at all the conventions and all the talks, it's really by software developers for software developers. But when you look at the business and team organizations, you have outside influence. Tim Hartford is an economist, and you also have psychologists that talk about how to run organizations and businesses, but you don't really have it within the software development world. The software development world is very much a closed ecosystem. The other thing is that not necessary technology is stuck, but I say software design mindset is stuck, that it's always the same way of doing things, that you have spent, you've done your due diligence or you've, you've proved yourself within the software development world, therefore you're the only one that can solve for software development designs. And I think I've seen this same, um, process over and over again throughout my 20 years here in, in the IT industry. And I'm, I have a feeling I'm not alone in this. But what I started to realize as well is that software design is like running a business, that when you create a software or a library, for example, or you just wanna change something within the software, 
that is essentially you are building something for everyone to use, which case you need to be focused on the customer, uh, customer experience. And at the same time, just like a business, you have employees. There's also people that are going to work on it. And a lot of times, I think software developers run into the problem that they treat the employees and the customers one and the same, that you are supposed to use this and you're also supposed to fix this. But if we start thinking about it as a business, I think we, that leads to better designs. The, same, the other thing is software design really is an art in the end. There's so much information out there that everyone can prove that they are technically right in the direction to go, even though it's complete opposite directions. But really, it comes down to it's art. You choose the information and how you want to proceed forward. As long as you're comfortable with it, proceed forward in that direction. And I think this is something that, as an industry as a whole, people don't really realize that whenever we bring up a design, it's not necessarily better. It's just your way of doing things. Your mindset is part of who you are. And finally, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to, or second to last, I'm going to talk about what I'm trying to solve for. So. When you have a team, you want to build a diverse team, people with different backgrounds, different cultures, different ways of thinking. Having a more diverse team allows for more creativity and a more, you know, more passion in the direction they want to go. You're not, you don't have everyone thinking and acting the same. And I think this is critical for a lot of teams. The other thing is everyone has experience. When you hire, even when you hire new people that have experience, uh, they some it takes a while for them to give their experience. Plus. There's no way an entire team can explain their collective experience throughout their entire time within a team. It's that you trust the people with their experience to make the right decisions. But more importantly, passion, I think, is what helps the team move forward, that everyone is passionate about what they are working on. And I think this is a great analogy here where when you have passion, you have the freedom to move forward and move far ahead in that direction. And you're, you don't feel like you're being blocked by any one person. That if you need help, you can ask for help. But if you have an idea, you can continue moving forward. And I think that's the key to passion. Failing better. Every team needs the ability to fail. And I think allow for failure. And when it comes to designs, you have to be free. Say, I this may not work, but I still want to try. I'm still passionate about this direction. Let's see what happens. And I think a team that cultivates that will cultivate better designs in the long run. And finally, at the end, we all want to design. So when somebody brings up the design, there's this, I think, incorrect assumption that everyone else is going to love their design, which is not the case. We all want to build our own designs. Maybe somebody has designed something and I can design on top of that and somebody else can design on top of me. Or maybe there's a separate area, another issue where I have the freedom to design, but we all want to design. I think this is something that's lost on many people. And finally, the solution. And this is how I think um, we can fix the situation. So think about when you are in charge, that when you are in charge of the design, ideas are cheap, to be honest. It's that an idea, you can summarize almost any idea in a couple of sentences. And what I've seen, if you start going into paragraphs, uh, a paragraph of the idea, then you're starting to sell an idea. But when you start talking about an idea longer and longer, it starts to become, in a, in a very real sense, a rule. And so ideas in the end really are cheap. It's the vision and passion, like how far you want to go, that is valuable. And that... Um, Design like you're expecting to own it to the end of time. And I think this is another thing. This is where, and I think a great, a great uh, quote that I've heard from boxing is that you don't punch at your opponent, you punch through your opponent. And so even if you design something and you're expecting the team to, to run with it, design it like you're going to continuously own it. Think it from that mindset. And when you do so, you are thinking about problems. You're, you're thinking about the future. How, from your experience, how do you think it's going to fail and try to recover from that? And finally, don't design for the business, design for your resume. Because when, again, it goes to that previous quote that I just talked about, if you design the for, biz, for the business, you're always just gonna solve for the business. The business can change directions. You could be laid off or even worse, fired. But when you start designing for your resume, the work you are doing is translatable to maybe your next step in your career or the next company you go to or even the next team. And when you're in charge, believe in your design. And when I say believe in the design, is don't expect people or don't have people liking it as a requirement. Design that with the hope that they will help out. So when you believe in the design, you, you are thinking, okay, I will, I'm going forward in this direction. They may not like it, but I still have a way to proceed forward if I don't get their help. Or I, I trust in this design well enough that I know they're going to like it in the long run. And this goes back to designs are like a business. The other thing is, don't prepare, don't just own it, but be prepared to fall on the sword. 
Meaning if it fails, take the ownership because the more you're willing to take the ownership of this design, if it fails, the less likely people are going to stand in your way because they know they're not going to be the ones taking it on. They're not going to, going to be ones being in charge. And so to me, this is also a very critical criteria for a success for you to be able to build a successful design. And when you're not in charge, think it from a different perspective, like how you want others to treat you with your design. Assume that the person who's talking about always has more information. They may not have explained it well enough or even long enough within maybe a 30 minute window or a presentation, but there always may be more information. The other thing I think is that when you, or when anyone, and I'm guilty of this as well, is that when you try to help or give advice to somebody else, you're speaking more from a fear of an unknown that it is possible that somebody has figured out something that you may think is certain failure, but for them it's certain success. And so every time we have that need to opine and say, hey, this is not a good direction, it is more for that fear of the unknown that we all have. And it's also why sometimes it's better to have multiple people work on something. Management feels better because then you have multiple people. You don't have one person moving forward, no matter how skilled they are. And Speak about how you think play, things will play out with somebody else's design. Don't try to stop them, but just say, if you go down this direction, this is what I think will happen. I've been in times where I was told that people thank me for speaking up a year later, because at the time people thought I was wrong and, and over-exaggerating, but a year later I was able to point out this is a problem and which came to fruition. And this is just pointing out, this is how I think it's gonna fail. And I think everyone should be able to do this. And this also allows us to learn from how, uh, allows everyone to learn if it's gonna fail going forward. We learn from our own failures, even if we predicted it wrong. And people always learn from their own mistakes, not somebody else's advice. You can give advice, but it's uh, giving advice to people is like have, keeping the training wheels on a bike. It's never gonna work. You eventually wanna take those training wheels off and let them fail on their own. Even if you told them and they did not listen, let them learn from that. It's only when they start making the same failures where you may wanna get involved. And when you want to contribute to somebody else's design, contribute at their own discretion, meaning they get to design the scope or they get to design what, what, ex, what scope or how you can help out. Because since it's their design, they may have a certain way of thinking or doing things that you don't want to stop them from doing it, something with, that they're comfortable with. And finally, and I think this is the most critical, passion is a fickle beast. It goes back to that road that I talked about earlier that advising people too much can make them stop, that you want people to feel like they can continuously move forward. It's not necessarily that you have to be involved, but they, they should not feel they're being stopped by you or somebody else. And what's the result of this? It builds an environment of a team where you start thinking, what, I wanna see what you can do, where everyone else is saying, I wanna see how you're gonna solve for this, or how, I wanna see what you can do in this situation. And I think that's where passion comes from. Not necessarily you should do it this way, but I wanna see what you can do. Now, teams are no longer afraid of brainstorming openly. And I think this is a big problem that no one wants to brainstorm openly because somebody else may have an idea and they'll hijack the conversation or maybe they'll hijack the entire design. That sometimes we all think it's better to work alone simply because talking about it means that everyone wants to be involved. Tenure becomes less critical and everyone is now in an open playing field. And there now is a less theoretical discussions and more real world discussions that when you start talking about a process or a design all the way through that it leaves, it just stays in the tech, in the theoretical world. But as you let people proceed forward in their own directions and then start talking about it, you can see those actions in, you know, in progress and you can see, okay, let's see, maybe I was uncomfortable with it at one point, but now I can see it in action and I'm not so uncomfortable with it. And also, silence is no longer an acceptance, and this is a word. This is a phrase I've always hated. That now silence becomes, I just don't see any red flags. I'm not going to stop you on this. And I think this is something that we should all allow people to do. Let's be honest. The software development world has a lot more introverts than extroverts, and people are not going to speak up unless that there is a serious issue. And finally, everyone now has the ability to solve big problems and not team problems. Because as I talked about the initial process. It's where everyone is trying to solve something for the team and maybe not solve something big or try something new and maybe realize it in a way that no one in the industry has realized before. That now everyone is empowered to go in a direction and just see how it's gonna play out. And as long as they're willing to own it, who should, no one should stop them. But finally, it has, honestly, all this comes down to for selfish reasons. Is that 
think about how we all learn. We all learn by watching somebody else or playing around with an existing process or design that if we are allow everyone else to go through a process and build or go through a design and build it out that we can learn after the fact that the problem most of the time is we all the managers or other teams they feel like we all have to learn together we all have to grow together and you know fail together and i think but if you allow everyone else to do that you get the cheat sheet at the end of it that when somebody has done something new and great and is now working in production, you get to come in and say, okay, now I can see the code, I can see what they did, I can see the problems that they had to deal with, I didn't have to deal with that, but I can look after the fact. And now, since I can do that, I can actually steal this idea as my own for later on. I can put this on my resume as something that I could speak to or something I have experience with. And if you allow every single team, every single member of the team learning new things that you can take on later on, I will be learning much faster. And I think a team will be learning much faster. And that's why I think a lot of this allowing people to move forward in their own directions is a valuable and very selfish way of doing things that I think it can benefit everyone's career. Thank you.